communities, healthcare teams, and they need the time to understand why is their heart sick and what can they do about it. This does not happen in a five minute conversation. These conversations can be 45 minutes to an hour in the HCM specialty center. And not many centers have the time or ability to do that, which is where patient advocacy comes in to help support that educational process as well as that emotional burden to understand why their heart is sick. So we have the diagnosis, we have the education, the treatment, and the support. And then you can put an arrow kind of back to education and support because we don't stay on a stable pathway. We might be great for 10 years and then we start to feel things differently as we age. The mitral valve gets a little wonkier as we age, gets a little, you know, aged. We all age and our symptoms may change. Or we may have children who have different issues than we had. Or we may have family members who have different issues. And your child gets diagnosed and that brings you right on back to that original shock of your own diagnosis. Now you have to deal with it with another person in the family. So all of this is a continual pathway. It is a lifelong disease. It does not go away. So I'm gonna skip that one and I'm gonna wrap up there. I'm gonna let our uh, Swedish group talk here a little bit because we are now moving to a different time and place. This team that I have put together and my, my board has put together has helped to develop our international outreach and part of our work is to pay it forward to other countries. And I am thrilled to say that we are at our first point where I get to hand the microphone or the cocktail table over to Marianne, who will be talking to you about HCM Swedish Society and her new experience. Marianne? And she's going to speak in Swedish, so I'm not going to understand much. <laughs> Thank you, uh, And as Lisa said, I will do this in Swedish. Or, uh, mer exakt, på svenska och i dagmål. Om, om ni undrar vad det är för märklig dialekt som ni hör. Uh, and we'll summarize it. Uh, yes. In Swedish. In Swedish. I think it's Danish. The Danish version of Swedish. Vi är så jätteglada och stolta över att vara här idag faktiskt. Uh, att uh, kunna presentera den nya patientföreningen Hypertrofisk Kardiomyopati Svenska Sällskap. Bara lära att säga det är en utmaning. Uh, och jag vill passa på in på att presentera, uh, vi har ju en alldeles ny styrelse sedan uh, kort tid tillbaka. Karolin, kan du mm. Ulrika. Mm. Och vi har Jerker. Mm. Och vi har Lottis också som kommer att säga några ord efter mig. Så jag vill egentligen bara säga några ord om varför vi är vi en patientförening för HCM. Och lite grann kopplat till min egen resa med HCM. Uh, och från några lärdomar och insikter som jag har fått under den här resan. Uh, min resa med HCM började 2008, där jag fick diagnosen med högt blodtryck. Och efter det så började lite olika symptom stiga sig. Jag kände tryck över bröstet när jag ansträngde mig, jag blev ir ibland. Lite sådana här diffusa symptom som jag kanske inte riktigt tänkte på heller. Jag var stressad småbarnsmord med eget företag och jag tänkte att det är ganska normalt att känna så här. Uh, om jag bara motionerar lite mer så kanske det blir bättre säkert. Jag. Uh, men jag nämnde det till min dåvarande läkare och han tyckte inte att det var något speciellt. Men åren gick, uh, symptomen tilltog uh, och under den här perioden så flyttade vi också uh, till den lilla dagarna som började nu. Uh, och där var naturen att komma till med stimmottagningen i stan. Och där fanns det förhäterna i Karlidor som kan saker och ting om HCM. Och jag hade turen att få komma till honom. Uh, mina symptom hade under tiden blivit sämre, jag blev tröttare. Uh, mer tryck över bröstet i ansträngning, mer yrsel. Alla de diffusa symptom som det kan, som det kan vara i HCM. Uh, så 2015 var det då, då fick jag diagnosen obstruktiv hypertrof kardiomyopati. Uh, och uh, så den resan också, när man lär sig och försöker hitta information, det är också en viktig del i varför det, nu, att det är så viktigt att stå här med en förening. För det finns verkligen, jag upplevde och många av oss upplevde att det är väldigt bristfärdigt med information om sjukdomen. 
vi vet vad är de söker och hittar den i livet. Och så frågar vi oss, men om det här är nu den liksom mest vanliga äldre hjärtsjukdomen, varför finns det så lite information? Varför, varför verkar ingen egentligen känna till den? Det är inte många av oss har hört talas om sjukdomen eller det fick diagnosen. Så det är också en stor drivkraft idag i att skapa den här patienten. Men när jag fick diagnosen, då hade jag redan forskat fram vad det fanns för olika behandlingsmetoder. Och jag var ganska övertygad om att det bästa för mig skulle vara en myokromi. Då en hjärtoperation som tärkommande med dem. Jag var mer övertygad om att myokromi var det bästa för mig och inte en alkoholoperation. Så jag hade turen, det visade sig att jag var en väldigt lämplig kandidat för myokromi. Så maj 2016 fick jag åka till Lund och jag blev opererad. Mm. Kan ni nämna några ord bara om vad alkoholoperationen är? Yeah. I, I will tell about the alcohol mm. ah, Yeah, I'll, I'll go over the, the invasive, ah, the ah, ah, invasive. Ah. So there are two different types of 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 Myokromin har blivit bäst, eller att alkoholoperationen har blivit bäst, det beror väldigt mycket på olika faktorer. Men för mig var det det bästa äh, alternativet. Äh, ja, men så då efter operationen så var det verkligen som natt och dag. Så före operationen och efter operationen. Före operationen, om jag gick för fort upp för en trappa, vad hände då? Ja, men då svimmar jag. Det hände ganska ofta. Äh, idag så kan jag springa upp för en trappa. Om jag vill, kanske inte vill, men jag kan. <laughs> det är en sån otrolig skillnad i livskvalitet före och efter operationen. Så det låter som en liten klyscha, men man kan ju säga att jag har fått mitt, mitt liv tillbaka. Jag har fortfarande HCM, eftersom det är obstruktionen som är borta, inte själva sjukdomen. Jag har fortfarande medicin och antibiotik, men mitt liv är ja, så mycket bättre. Så det är också någonting, den resan som vi vill dela med oss till patienter som får diagnosen och deras anhöriga. För det är en, en resa och man ska inte behöva göra den ensam. För mig var det en väldigt ensam resa. 2014 när jag började forska i det hela till 2018 så träffade jag aldrig någon med HCM. Jag hade aldrig pratat med någon som hade HCM. När jag åkte ner till Lund för att operera på min center. Så det är just det här att vara ett stöd för anhöriga och patienter. En sån grundväldigt viktig del. Mm. Så sammanfattningsvis så tänker jag. Ingen patient ska behöva göra den resan ensam. Utan vi ska finnas som stöd. Vi ska också finnas där för att sprida kunskap och information. Och jag tror en av de viktigaste sakerna också är, för det har jag tänkt på efterhand, att, att jag står här idag är en kombination av tur och att jag som person var liksom drivande och påläst. Jag visste vad jag ville och jag kämpade för det. Men det skulle inte behöva handla om vad jag tur eller att man är drivande, utan det ska finnas. Så det är därför som vi vill jobba för hcm centra kan vi kalla det, som Lisa var lite inne på. Att det ska finnas centraliserat. Ja. Det är vårt svar. Ja. Men det ska finnas hcm centra med samlad expertis och samlad kunskap. Vi ska inte behöva förlita oss på tur eller att vi är drivande som personer. Så det är nog en av de viktigaste sakerna som vi vill jobba för. Som sagt, vi är väldigt glada och stolta över att vi har startat. Vi förstår att det kan bli en positiv spännande sak. Tack. Check that I'm summarizing. So, Maria, I, I've touched your heart. Yes. Yeah. So, let's say the, the depth of that. It's very nice, strange feeling for me to. 
I'm <laughs> much more patient. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, just a brief summary of what uh, you have to correct me if I'm getting it wrong. But it, first, it, she introduced the Swedish society. I have a trouble card in my book. Then, yeah. yeah. and, and, and presented the board. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then <clears throat> you started to, to Started to feel sick. I mean, and that, that was, which is very difficult, especially for women. Mm -hmm. to, so, so you started to feel sick in 2008, uh, but, uh, with these rare symptoms, symptoms that are actually typical for the disease, but also fit with everything else. Or at least so. So, but it it, it, it took uh, up until 2015 before you were diagnosed. That was after moving to another Swedish town in, in, in northern Sweden, mm -hmm. where actually one of our hocomologists from Lund uh, is working as a local thing. It's pretty common in, in, in Scandinavia that, that the doctors, we go somewhere and I do some surgery somewhere else and go back and, 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 and the cardiologist is, is the same and they make it. So that's pretty common. So, so he found you and he contacted me. And, and he also reason that I am up in Lund. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, so there. And and, and then, then after that you had your surgery and, and then you reflect on what, what the difference you said you, you got your life back. Yeah. 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 Complete different the quality of life that you reflected on. And and, uh, and one more I think very important uh, key point in your talk was that you, you felt very lonely, like you were the only one in Sweden having this diagnosis right now. I mean, you traveled to learn if you and, and you had surgery and there was kind of no one else on. You didn't meet anyone on the train with it, or <laughs> it felt like that you were. And I, I think that that I mean, that's my own feeling that this is one of the reasons that, that you started this because yeah. you you don't want you call the you don't want any patient to feel alone like that. Oh, you're so much alike your grandmother. 
Yeah. And, and also I was on and off. I was very explosive. I was very, I had a good policy net, good sense for balls. And, and I was very sporty. I was playing football. I was riding horses, playing tennis. And I, I could do all the explosive sports. But when the football team was jogging in the evening, I couldn't do that. So my endurance was was what was different. And um, when I became a, a teenager, it, it really was a, a shift. It became more difficult. And you know, teenagers, they party, they drink. And keeping up with my friends and doing that was so exhausting for me. So I decided to become a nun. So I wouldn't be in the fun business. So I became religious for six years and I didn't drink and I didn't have any boyfriends and just a way to survive. So all my life has been finding different ways to look like I was normal and, and living a normal life. Like in the football, I would be a goalkeeper when we were playing Ben Bolland. What's that? I would always, yeah, I was always catching the ball because I didn't want to run. And so I think that's common that we find the, the easy way out. And um, and then I got pregnant. I was I was 32, and that was the big difference when I realized that oh, it is the heart. And uh, when I was six or seven months pregnant, I, I really felt the notice, and I was so exhausted and I started to be afraid of the delivery and I broke up with my boyfriend and life was chaotic and and in the end of my pregnancy I, I developed really high blood pressure and and uh, some kind of aphasia. I, I couldn't understand what people were saying and it was only substantive. No, no, no. Yeah, I could We'll be talking about, I, I'm a physiotherapist because I became a physiotherapist so that I could take care of my own health. Because I felt there is something wrong, but I didn't know what, what it was. So we were talking about antibiotics. I said, what is antibiotics? I don't know what. And I knew that I should know it. So, and so they put me in the hospital because of this. And I had really high blood pressure. So they, they started the delivery a little bit earlier. They thought maybe I had the, what do you call it? Yeah. yeah. Because there were also a little protein in the, in the, in the weed and things like that. But the delivery was very difficult. They had to give me, you know, this, so they get it started because I, I, I tried for eight hours, nothing happened. I didn't open up. And then I opened up for uh, oh, eight centimeters in half an hour. And um, I was so exhausted, I couldn't push. And I couldn't understand, you know, I've seen all these movies, <coughs> women are pushing and pushing and they look really strong. And I felt totally like a dead fish. So they had to, you know, push out the baby and cut up and then soon. And, uh, and because she became really blue, she, they saw that the oxygen was coming down, so I probably didn't give her enough oxygen. And after the delivery, usually blood pressure should go down, but it didn't. So I had to stay in the hospital for 10 days. And um, they didn't think so much that it could be the heart or something, but they gave me a referral to the doctor, and two or three months later, I went to see a medical doctor, and he took my EKG, and he said, no, oh, no problem. But I had really high blood pressure, so I had to start medicate after this delivery. And after two months, about uh, when he said something, nothing is wrong with your heart, uh, I started to have arrhythmias. So it was like the heart was skipping beats, and I, I felt it really hard pumping. And um, I went to the hospital, and they just said, oh, you just need one. Uh, baby mother and you're stressed, you're not sleeping properly. My, my child had colic, so, so I didn't sleep much. So that was the explanation. 
But then I started to paint, and I was alone at home with my baby every time it happened. So I'm not the kind of worried person, so I never, you know, I never called the ambulance or anything. I just, next time I saw my general practitioner, I said, okay, I painted. Uh -huh. And then they just assumed that it was just, you know, female painting, nothing, nothing serious. Mm -hmm. So, and um, blood pressure didn't go down, so they started to give me um, more medication, three different medications, and I just got more and more exhausted. And, and uh, then I got the diagnosis, oh, you are depressed from exhaust, exhausted depression. And uh, so they started to give me this kind of medication for depression. And I said, no, I'm not depressed. I mean, I'm a happy person. I look forward to life. I, I, I can laugh. I'm not depressed. I feel like this. And then he, he said, oh, in order to make the pres prescription, I had to write that you have anxiety. And uh, so that came into my journal. And then everybody I met after that, they just treated me as if I was a psychiatric problem patient. So I got sicker and sicker, and um, the Försäkringskassa, the insurance, they, they said, we will, we will not give you any money for being sick uh, unless you go in, in therapy. So I had to go in therapy. And then after that, they said, oh, you have to be in this group. And then I thought, people like, you know, alcoholics and people who's been to the prison and, and really depressed people and, you know, people having problems. I had to be in that group, otherwise they wouldn't give me any money. So, about that time I decided I can't stay in this country anymore. And then I was happy to meet a very charming Icelandic man. So I decided to go and live there and for a year. And, and I started my own business as a physiotherapist there, and he um, he was not the person I thought he was, so I <laughs> left him after a few months. But my daughter and I, we enjoyed the Iceland, so we said we will stay here and have an adventure. So, so I was working really hard, and because I didn't speak Icelandic, I, I did a lot of manual manipulations, you know, tricky points, massage. And that was the worst thing I could do for this kind of heart, because it's a it's very strenuous activity. So after just working for two months, I started to have really serious arrhythmias again. And also beginning to have this almost painting experience. But since I hadn't enough money, I had to pay for my own being sick, and I hadn't saved up the, the money for that. I just had to continue to work. Because I, had, I, I hadn't been able to pay the bill or the food or anything. So it took me a year until I went to the doctors. Because I didn't want to know that something was wrong with my heart. I was getting all kinds of other explanations. And then they saw this uh, ECOG that this could be hypertrophy. So they sent me to the car cardiologist and, uh, and they did ECHO. That was my first ECHO. And he said, oh, you have a very, very big heart much more than 15. And I can't measure it properly. I didn't get proper views. And then um, he just took very, very short questions about me and left my symptoms from the heart very quickly and went on to the heart and other diseases. And then he built his understanding of me that it was just because of hypertension. So this has followed me since, that my hypertrophy was just because of hypertension. And um, we did really intense treatment. He, he made cocktails of different uh, hypertension medications. And I just got sicker and sicker and sicker. And I started to refuse. I said, I can't. I mean, I have no life. I couldn't go skiing anymore because uh, I had no blood circulation in my feet and legs. And, and then, before I came to Iceland, I, I was very uh, near to uh, Submissive? Yeah, submissive towards my doctors and always accepted what they say, but I was always thinking, no, it can't be right. 
But now in Iceland, I started to, you know, this is wrong. And I became a really difficult patient. So we, we were not friends. And um, so I got sicker and sicker. And uh, in, the, in the night, I was getting a pink broke from the mouth. And really, a lot of pain in the night. I wasn't breathing properly. And really, all signs of really serious heart failure. But they were ignoring me totally. So I didn't go. Uh, I stopped going the last half year. And then my family in Sweden said, you have to come back to Sweden. In Sweden, they will help you. So they helped me, and I went back to Sweden. But the first thing that they did was calling Iceland. What's wrong with this person? <laughs> and they gave their story about me, so they started to treat me the same way. I didn't get a second opinion in Sweden. And then after, on the west coast of Sweden, I, I had stopped being able to fight. I, I just, I had to fly. Fly? Fly? Fly. Flee. 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 Escape. So I went up to the north, north of Sweden, where I had a brother. And, uh, but he didn't tell me that they were the poorest region and the most difficult hospital in the whole of Sweden. So it was Sundsvall when they had really big economic problems. That's when I moved there. So it took me almost a year until I had my first echo. And, um, and then I had over the years, altogether, I think, 10 echoes before I found a doctor that was clever in understanding what he was seeing, and he took one hour to do the echo. And he saw that I have a very strange heart. Because if you, if you, if you look at this picture, I'm, my heart is like the one with the mid ventricular. So usually they, they just look at it in the top here, and I wasn't very thick there, so they thought I was not even thick. I was just making things up. But he saw this, and then he saw I had papillary muscle, wrong position, so it was making a problem for my mitral valve. And, and I was born with this, so this explained a little bit, but it was so rare to find an echo, echo logo, what do you call it, ultrasound to be clever enough to find the rare. They say that each HCM patient are different from the other one. And I've done a rough calculation, and I think the, the different things that I have, it's maybe one in 10,000. So it's not easy for them, the doctors, to, to find us. And we, we maybe have only 30% of the people diagnosed in Sweden. We have like almost 70% to find. And they are all around us with all kinds of different diagnoses. So I, I finally found, when I got my diagnosis, Google, of course, I found Lisa and the, the Facebook group. And Lisa was speaking on a video saying, oh, we have this. Uh, uh, scholarship. If you want to be a member and you're very poor, then you can apply for the scholarship. And I said, oh, that's my chance. <laughs> so I did. And she was interested in me. So she contacted me and she said, oh, we have a winner here. And, and then I became a member and that gives you 45 minutes to talk with Lisa over, over Zoom. So I explained my situation and she asked me to send over all my protocols and everything. And then she said, oh, I know this Swedish surgeon, and he's here <laughs> in the States. And I had heard that he's going to move back to Sweden. So um, uh, she contacted Per, I think. Yeah. And Per asked me to send my Swedish uh, journals and to read. So he became interested. And then um, I also sent pictures from, from uh, ultrasound. And then he says, oh, we think that the, you could come down here to London and do some examinations and, and maybe we can help you. So I had to pay for that myself. And, uh, and they decided that they could help me. So uh, then I had to fight for uh, oh, half a year or so up in my region to get the surgery because they didn't even understand that 
I needed the surgery. They didn't even think it would help me. And it has totally changed my life. So the understanding of obstructive hypomyopathy myopathy is very low. And even though I have heart failure still, that's nothing compared to the obstruction that I have. I have a new life and, and it's, it's fantastic. So that's why I want to, you know, I don't want to let more people go through what I do. It's very, it's very unstrained of them. Exhausting. That's very difficult for my relationships with my family and friends. They, they have judged me as if I was something else, but it was a heart disease. So it's tough. I lost my career. I, I haven't been able to work since I was 47 because of the heart. Now I'm trying to, to work a little bit, but most of my time I, I think it will be charity. So, so I, I really hope that you take this with you and, and that you will have this diagnosis in the back of your mind when you talk to other people. Maybe especially women because we are more misunderstood and help us spread the awareness of this disease. <laughs>
turned and holds it. Some visa people can say this is uh, this field of uh, actually pretty much at least is a living target. And for those of you not fluent in Danish, I'll, I'll translate it. You'll read to see if I'm talking about the moving targets. So this is the same sign. The, the word up there means uh, running tracks, what people are running. And the lower one on the same sign is a sharp shooting range for moving targets. Yeah. <laughs> that is fantastic. So I, I just ran away from it. But I think it illustrates well. OK, so, so when, when you have uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, an obstructive one, the, the initial uh, treatment invasively was surgical with a moro. He did his moro wrong. Uh, and that is practically uh, cutting out the piece of muscle. And, and uh, let's see if I can, yeah. You, you see, so, so this year you've opened the aorta. So this is here, you open. Uh, the leg is about three centimeters wide. You, you look. You can see the left main coronary artery here. The right is hidden behind, and you see the white here is the aortic valve. You're sneaking down through all of that, and then, then you see the, uh, the thickest muscle. Down here is the mitral valve. So you simply cut out the piece of muscle in the middle. That was his moral run. And if it's really narrow, of course, that that does help if you get something out. And um, so, so and the, the early results showed that, that if, if you did this, they, they, those patients survived more or less like the, the normal American patient would do. Uh, and if you didn't, if you just had medical treatment alone at that time, it, it, they, they died off. Uh, uh, too which, which year is this? Uh, and so th this, this was published in 2005, so it's oh, looking it's way back. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so. So, but if you think, if you're cutting out a small piece of muscle in the middle, then the cardiologist was thinking, ah, we can do that as well. Mm -hmm. So, so, so they are, uh, so, so this is a coronary angiogram. So uh, for those of you who are not, so, so the black is the contrast. You see the different blood vessels to the heart. There are the blood vessels on the left and, uh, and on the right side, and this is on the left. And, and the left main here divides quickly into the circumflex artery, which is not important in this disease. But this one is the main artery of the heart, left anterior descending or, uh, artery. And, and, and that goes and feeds blood to the septum. And, and as we've learned when you have this, and especially those with obstructive, the muscle is thick, uh, high up in the septum. So they injected alcohol down here. This is the alcohol cephalization in the first branch of this. And this, and you can see, and eventually you see it disappears. It's gone. And this, if you're looking at the, at the echo, this, this again, for those of you who are not familiar with, with ultrasound of the heart, so you have the, the atriums over here, you have the left and the right. You have the ventricles, the left and the right. So the blood is coming from the lungs. It pumps from the right side up to the lungs, coming back on the left side here, uh, and, and uh, then coming in through the mitral valve, you can see here, into the left ventricle. And when the heart contracts something, uh, uh, the mitral valve closes and, and the blood is squeezed out through the aortic valve, which is here. Here you see the septum. It's a wall between the left this is too thick, as you can see. So, and when you inject alcohol, you, you create the damage, and you can actually practically see the alcohol on the on the on the on the echo. It, it comes up a bit different. It looks very whitish, as you can see. So, so this worked fine, but but unfortunately, the uh, uh, me was still more efficient than than the ablation itself. But it, it's quicker. It can get to you. But some problems with this was that the patient went home and then they came back dead after three weeks, which is not really a success story. Uh, so, so because you can, when you, in, 
course you want to create a good enough results so they get a little bit too much you, you can create the hole so the muscle is dead so you have a ventricular septal defect which that's a lethal complication mm -hmm. most of the time uh, you can also have uh, arrhythmias that, that's much more worse uh, at, 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 the, at, at the surrounding so being part and you also uh, So they, they started to modify their techniques, uh, cardiologists. So they used small balloons instead of larger. They only injected one milliliter of alcohol, and they did not repeat the injections. Yeah. So that, that's the difference. But still, with that, there are some challenges with this treatment, going non-invasive, let's say. And to, to, I'm going to show you examples of all of this. So, so you have residual obstruction of the alcohol septal ablation. It doesn't really take care of it. Yeah. it. It's very tricky to treat the patient with a severe hypertrophy. And, and the other tricky group is the one with very mild hypertrophy, yet severe uh, left ventricular artery tract obstruction. I'll explain how that comes. And the, the reason for that is frequently mitral valve that, that's involved. And of course, you don't want to have a pacemaker if not necessary. So a pacemaker is very good, it can be life-saving. However, a pacemaker can get infected. We are seeing more and more of that. Uh, uh, and we have to take them out and it, they can damage the tricuspid valve. So good with pacemakers, but only if you need it. So and if the treatment should not uh, induce the need for pacemaker. So I'll go over a couple of different uh, methods to explain why it's not so easy to just do it with alcohol. This is one case. Here you have a, a severe septal thickness. Now we go back to see that. So you have the left atrium here, mitral valve here. Uh, this is the cavity of the left ventricle. This is the septum. And, and you see this is very thick. It should be below 15, so 12 to 14. This is very, very thick. And even if you inject uh, alcohol, you're not going to take care of this problem. 12 to 14 millimeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That, that's a normal yeah. set of yeah. so, and But it's pretty easy. I did this patient, and, and uh, you see here I have resected off. It looks completely different than my valve. It, it's wide open. That's done by, by a thorough myectomy. And this is uh, the echo before he's being discharged. And again, you see, this is, the, this is the output tract up here. There's a good enough space. And, and, and this is the output tract here. So, so that's.
Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Here we have the next the next case. So so you have a patient like like this instead. You see, there is hardly any uh, hypertrophy. So only 40 millimeters. Uh, but yet this patient could produce a gradient of 108. You see that wow. that's really high. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the cutoff is about 50 millimeters of gradient. So the, this is really high. And, and, and here it's not so so easy to to. There, there must be a different mechanism. But, and this is another one like this. You see, you see the patient here, the left atrium mitral valve, aortic valve, septum. It's, it's just a little bit thick here. You see, there's a funny movement of the mitral valve. Let's see if I can, let me see if I show you again. It's a funny movement, you see, it's, it's moving and touching the septum. That's what we call SAM, yeah, systolic anterior motion. And that's what, what all microsurgeons and, and, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, are worried about. You know, is you have uh, systolic anterior motion of, of the mitral region, so it touches the septum, so it more or less practically closes off, off uh, this. It, it's like if you have open windows and it's blown, and it's almost like the door is just, you know, the windows being shut. Yeah, so uh, this is when the patient frequently uh, pass out. Sometimes they pass out and never wake up. Again. So this is how we dealt with it. You see, you see, it's about the same. And this is post surgery. You see, there, there is well, it, it's wide open there, it's not leaking in the mitral valve. The symptom is there. So the way we dealt with it, and I, and I must say, so so it is uh, Dr. Smidera, a colleague of mine. He really, I mean, Bruce Leiter, you gave it. Bruce Leiter started it to do it. And I was fella there, and, and, and it was very intense when he was doing that. And, 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 and Smidera took on it and more or less took over. And then, so Smidera, he, he came up with this newer idea how, how to deal with these tricky cases where, where you, you still have, you have a severe obstruction, but there's not much muscle. You have to think that the Mayo Clinic, I mean, at least when we are discussing with them, mm-hmm. they, we never do anything but cutting the muscles. And we're just thinking, oh, that would be dangerous in, in these patients. But it's been like, we are positioning us a little bit different. Uh, they have very good results, uh, so, but, but I suspect that, that the results are a little bit dependent on Lisa sending patient with big muscles to Mayo and those with small and thinner wow, muscles to us. <laughs> No, no. So, so Schmidier had developed this, and then we worked together. So, so he, he fixed it. So, so the, the, the trick is we we still do myotomy because anyhow, even if it's very thin, uh, thin, there's still scar tissue kind of holding uh, the the left ventricular tract in place. So, by just cutting a little bit, you you release the tract so so that the septum can move away. From this is just a little bit micronic, much much smaller than what I took out of the <laughs> So and, and then he recently we say a small piece of the of the mitral valve. And <clears throat> this might seem strange. So but these valves, they have been pulled for every heartbeat for the last 20 years. So it, 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 so they behave the same way as if you have really heavy air rings and really hanging you and you can imagine after Ears, the, 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 the ears are a little bit bigger than you were born with. So, so, and that is the same uh, for these. So, so, and, and that can get cooled in the bloodstream and kind of start the sound problem. And then the third thing that Spidera developed was the papillary muscle reorientation. So, in many of these patients, and especially in the patient with not with a thinner septum. The, the muscles are not placed where they are supposed to be. And for those of you who are not familiar with papillary muscle, so the mitral valve, you see there are two leaflets. They open and close like this, and they stay in shape with thin threads called cording that goes down to the papillary muscle that are controlled. So in these patients, they are both incorrectly placed up 
two points in center, and some of them are like long finger like moving around easily. And, and in those, so we both uh, detach them and then suture them back and anchoring them more posteriorly away from the center. And, uh, and you detect this on the ultrasound? Yeah, you can see it uh, on some of the ultrasound, you see it better on the MRI, uh, but you most important to see it in surgery. Yeah. So, so if I'm doing a case where we have the, the septum is only 16 millimeters or something like that, I'm pretty sure I'm going to find something mm -hmm. that, that, that. And if I have a 28 millimeters, it's highly unlikely that I am to do it because it's just taking away mm -hmm. the muscle for the So, practically, what so the modern technique that I think Smedira has developed for this, and so I'll quickly go over it. Let me know if I'm falling, if the time is running out. So, okay. yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. so, so, so we start with the, the classical Moro in the middle, then you continue, go up to the side and to the other side, uh, um, go there, and then you, you actually continue further down. In the, most patients have these parts uh, coming down to the mid ventricular portion. It's really important that you get far down. So I frequently get at least to the mid carotid portion. Uh, and I, I do that, I never open the apex. I, I always sneak, sneak down. Yeah, myself. And, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, and there are just tricks, because you, you don't normally see it, uh, but there are tricks how you can rotate the heart. So, so uh, again, that's going to be a you go way down until you are into normal muscle and normal trabecula. Then you look at the mitral valve. You see here, this to the trained eye is about a few millimeters too long that you need to take off. Uh, and this is, a, I would say, highly exaggerated picture of the mitral valve. But you see it's too long and you simply cut it off there. And, and then the third thing is, is to do the papillary muscle. You think this is very, very long surgery, but it's not. So, so if you just do myectomy, isolated, uh, for for us, uh, it's uh, it's typically uh, the heart is stopped for about 28 minutes. If you add a micro procedure, it takes another set, seven minutes to so. So it, it's because we don't go in through a different hole. We just use the same hole and you work, and you you have to be used to working through a paper roll. Do you and, do any aphid procedures? Yeah, yeah. On, on, on all patients, all patients with any aphid, more or less, they, they get uh, all the way from aphid parts. So small it's, it's just pulmonary vein isolation and the aphid lift. Or if, if they have a more larger problem, you may see it happen. Yeah. So, so that's very efficient. But that takes a little bit longer. So, is this, uh, ask you, is this like comparable to a valve replacement in terms of anti pulmonary bypass encroachment? No, I, actually, this is so short. So, uh, this is way much, much shorter. Short. So, so, so uh, it's uh, a normal coronary bypass or valve replacement. The heart is normally stopped around like 50 minutes to one and a half hour, something like that. So. It's not because these are easier, but these were only severe and I used them. And, 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 and well, yeah, I got it. The US is strange. I got one patient coming to me, and he said, because you, are, you, you aren't the fastest surgeon, microsurgeon in the US, he could find out that the cross can't time. Mm -hmm. so, so, but those of us would use it. This takes time if you're an experienced, but in experience, yeah, and in unexperienced hands, they don't tend to go to technique. No, no, no. Far yeah. They use more time, and, but they don't go. <laughs> they, they, they stop uh, too early. They might take too, because normally you don't take very much at the beginning, and then you start to gain more and more mm -hmm. as you go down. But the unexperienced typically stop too early, might take too much too early, or most of the time take too little. But, yeah. Is it on severe importance with the time? No, no, but 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 but, but uh, it, it's not the it's not the other most important, but but 
but it certainly the patient feels better uh, oh. if, if you have a short, short uh, time on, on heart lung machine. So, but it's not like they're going to die off. Uh, it takes ten more. Yes. Uh, but the complication is related to how long it takes. Yeah. So, so um, this is the likelihood of, of us having to add micro uh, procedures to this uh, is is depending upon the thickness of the septic. So for those with, with very mild hypertrophy, most of them we have to do something with the micro to get rid of those rushes. Uh, and for those with 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 a pretty heavy septic. Uh, it's not so often, but, but in some people. So then that's how they do that. And this is just to look at the results for the last 1600 patients. So, so a third was isolated septomyectomy. A third needed this mitral valve procedure that, that I. Yes, another third needed something else like a maze procedure, uh, a blood vessel to the heart, or, or an aortic. And this is experienced from Sweden and Cleveland? Yeah, this is Smedera's. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's Smedera's. But in, in Cleveland, but we have about the, the, the same. About the, yeah, I think it's about the same in Lund. And I think I have about 40% where, where there might go by a new term. Looking at the gradient before we are uh, sending the so, so that the cardiologists are really provoking, trying to make sure that, that, that we're not sending them somewhere back to Florida or Alaska, and then and as soon as they start to tie their shoes, they're gonna pass out again. So, so, that they, so these, these grades are the maximum provocable gradient, and then they are very good. Yeah. The, the pacemaker need, that, that was one of the issues when you're using alcohol elevation. So if, if they have normal, we have a new conduction, normal, normal working heart. You see it in light blue. It's it's uh, it's uh, about one to one and a half percent to need a pacemaker. And and, uh, and if they have if they have uh, so typically if they've had their alcohol septal elevation first, many of those patients get a right ventricular block, uh, branch block. When we do myectomy, we always have on left side so they get the left bundle branch block. So 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 if you combine by thinking, oh we start with the alcohol elevation and we'll see if that works it's fine, otherwise they can always do surgery. That is not as smart as it might sound. So because these patients are inevitably gonna end up with a pacemaker. So it's better to to, to make the correct decision there. So our septal defect was 0.1%. I might go, so I, I, I took the stick again. Yeah, yeah that's no problem. I just want to inform that we're going to have the uh, panel discussions will end in about 10 minutes. Yeah. And then we're going to have a, a short, there's also a remark in uh, about 10 minutes. So. Yep. Can you say again? Uh, right, yeah. So the mortality is, is way below 1%. One of the uh, one interesting uh, study that came out of Cleveland. So, uh, so, so normally, uh, I mean, we have in the guideline we have class one indication for surgery. In class one indication for for for, for myectomy means that the, you should have a uh, gradient uh, about fifty maximum medical treatment and functional class. And that, 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 then you're really symptomatic, really symptomatic. But our cardiologists, the homologists, they knew uh, that the results uh, for, for my activity. So, so when they had a patient who had a provocable gradient of 50, were on maximum medical treatment and had some symptoms, they didn't, they didn't wait. Uh, so they sent them for surgery. Still, we anyhow got from, from all over the country some patients with some severe symptoms. 
So you have two groups, and either you wait, uh, either you wait or you, you, you treat them in a more variety of surgery. And this is the outcome. So in, in terms of uh, from primary composite events, that, that's uh, death or, or recurrent symptoms from heart failure. So the red is those where you wait until they have severe symptoms before you treat them. The dotted line is the dated of the US. The blue are those This is uh, just a systematic review uh, comparing alcohol septal ablation and septal myectomy. So I'll just go very quickly, but practically, so, so even though we do surgery, big surgery, there is no difference in mortality because it's so low compared to just uh, the point of But in terms of uh, heart failure symptoms, This is the latest guidelines, basic guidelines. So for most patients with this, the progression to drug refractory symptoms, you, you should go for surgical myectomy. And for those patients who are not suitable for surgery, they should go for uh, alcohol substance. And I think it's very important what they have written here at the experience center. And otherwise it might help and it might harm them. Maybe that you would speak about the American? Yes, it is other American, yeah. But on uh, uh, isotropic radiomyopathy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought that maybe the European guidelines are on the verge of being uh, updated yeah. next year. Yeah, next year in the fall of 23. Yeah. Fall of 23. Fall of 23. The, the other uh, are, are a little bit older, from 2014 to 13. Okay. So, okay, thanks. There. And, and uh, I can just show you one quick video. Is, is this okay? Yeah. Yeah. This is one patient uh, where, where he has a combination mm -hmm. of, of uh, both mitral valve prolapse. So if you just go back to the here, my hands. Uh, the two leaflets, they open, let the blood in, and when the heart beats, it closes like this. And, and uh, so when you have prolapse, the cordae, they are too long, so they meet up here. And then he also had a myopathy and sap. So, so so, so he had a bad obstruction. He had up to 60 inches. He could put, he was provoked up to 130. Uh, so then he contacted me. He wanted me to do this minimally invasive. Because I've done a boatload of surface myectomies, and I've done a boatload of my, uh, robotic mitral valve surgery. But it's not very frequent to combine. Chip, we did some, and it's a little bit, but it's not that. So now, uh, and we, we discussed it discussed with my family. And, and uh, so, so um, and this is, we decided to go, and I told the patient I'd never done this combined, but, so, but he was, uh, so, so here you have both uh, uh, the, the, the moving funny, it's pulled to the, to the, to the septum, and now you know it's called SAP. And, and, and you also have a program. So this is what, what practically what, what we did. You, this is, you, you have the knuckle, you cut it off like that. And then you address, and you see here, this is how we do, you start to, to open up the anterior mitral leaflet like this. And then you see the septum with the robot. So now you're making a small opening here. Uh, I later did it in also, so it, it, you go in the inframammary hole here. So, uh, and then you can easily see exactly what you're doing. You cut out as much muscle as you need. Then you suture the mitral valve back like that. And, and all of these patients, their anterior leaflets are a little bit too long. And so by cutting and then suturing the back, you practically shorten it so the stitch, which is, works perfectly fine. 
and, and then you do have to have a sort of reorientation. This is a three minute video. Through the whole thing, through, through the book. Mm -hmm. I want to take that. Yeah. <laughs> so here I open, and you see, you see the, uh, the, the, this is the septum. You can actually see the auric valve, and then I just start cutting. You can take out as much as, as you need. I didn't need to take so much on that, but I do. Then you suture it back. This is the developer. You, you see this very well, but when I'm doing the surgery, I'm sitting in it, the 3D, I have a feeling I'm inside his heart. Wow. So, so it, it looks like the valve is uh, this big, and I'm, I'm just looking around, so it's fantastic. Yeah. Here we are reorienting the papillary muscles. I'm anchoring, I'm using valve stitches. Those are too high up, those two. This one is a good one down there. there. And then I'm, I'm suturing them further. Is, is it the, are you using the Da Vinci there? Yes, it's the Da, da Vinci. Then I'm addressing finally the prolapse of the microcele. This is the posterior leaflet, which is floppy and big. And, and I'm anchoring cortex cord a couple of them before making it. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. I started robotic mitral surgery in 2012 in Lund. So, so very the only one. Yeah. But, but like yeah. out of hundred myectomies, no, no, only no. Very, 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 very few. This we, we, I've only done a few. I, I, so it's <laughs> yeah. really. I mean, because it's it's normally so it's that it's, 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 uh, there are some <laughs> issues with the robot. Uh, the scissor is not big enough. Uh, there are some, but it's pretty cool that for the selected patient it works very well. And then he, this is what it looks like. At the end. There's no micro regurgitation. It's wide open. So no, no break -in. It's it stayed fine. And then there. So finally, it's just in the middle. We can address the pathology in many different ways. It's really cool. <laughs> Yes, uh, but uh, uh, so we did some of them, Moses, but you're right, I did some of them. And we go in the same way. So we, we don't do the Mayo Clinic opening up the apex. So we simply continue continue down, down, down and do it through the aura. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can enter in my house with the key. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 
Ja, ja. ja. Okay. Det var man, man lader det, hvor man tror, man skal falde af over. Det er jo en dag, men det er ikke så altså, en del træningsopgave. Ja. Og ofte er det så, at man, man, ser, man ser lidt større. Altså, man, man, ser, man ser længere snit. Altså, jo mere er for mig, desto længere snit tager du, desto jævnste ting. Altså, det er mye lettere at spille, når du ser. Men det er klart, at når du ser snit. Altså, så er So if you're having, uh, so, so how, how we practically cut this with experience, you, you cut longer cuts, you make longer cuts, uh, slightly more, it, it becomes much nicer and it's actually easier, given that you're not on the wrong foot, then you're not disoriented, because then you make it all the time, but it's easier. And the beginners typically cut a millimeter or something like that, and then you end, and it ends up like an inch deep or something like that. Uh, that's, better to make nice smooth cutting and that's why that's why it doesn't take very long you <laughs> take out pieces like sushi pieces I don't know what that is. Oh, fantastic yeah, thank you very much <laughs>